Good morning, everybody, and it's wonderful to be here. It's such a privilege to be here. When I was asked to consider if I would like to participate in this conference, I thought, what a great opportunity to come together with a group of professional women who are aspiring to develop their careers and grow. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Ireland. I grew up in Ireland in the 70s. Ireland in the 70s was behind the times. <laughs> women in Ireland, uh, in the banking sector and the civil service, um, when they became married, they had to resign. It was called the marriage bar. In 1973, the marriage bar was eliminated. And in 1973, Ireland became part of the European Economic Community. And this opened Ireland up to uh, free trade with the rest of the European community. Um, so this was the environment I grew up in, an environment of growth, opportunity and change. I chose a degree in chemical engineering and I graduated from University College Dublin and I had a green card which I managed to acquire through a lottery in the newspaper. So with my green card and my degree I decided to go to America and I did a degree in a Masters in Chemical Engineering in the University of Missouri Rolla. <laughs> go Rolla! And from there, I got hired on at Caterpillar. So hard work, the willingness to pursue opportunities, and the ability to make huge personal change enabled me to become part of corporate America. And I thought I had arrived. <laughs> Little did I realize that my degree was just the beginning. It was just the beginning of how I was going to function in the workplace. I had a lot to learn about continuing and surviving in the workplace. In 1925, Caterpillar um, was created. There was the CL Best Tractor Company and the Holt Manufacturing Company, and they merged to form the Caterpillar Tractor Company. Over the years, this company has grown to be a huge global corporation, providing products and services in the mining and construction industry, energy and transportation. Um, we have a massive dealer network and a huge aftermarket business. So it was a traditional heavy duty industrial company. A male dominated environment steeped in years of history. Very often you would hear the words, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this is how we've always done it. <laughs> so very often we think when we start our careers, that if I do a good job and I get good results, I'll be secure in my role. But there are many things we can do to help ourselves develop in our careers, and there are many things our company can do to create an environment of growth and opportunity. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. What are some of the things that I've done personally to try to advance my career, and what are some of the things my company is doing to create a more diverse and inclusive environment? So, when I began my career, I didn't realize how important my network was. And I took a variety of roles, and each role I had different responsibilities and a broader scope. And as I moved through these areas, I, I was getting visibility and exposure to different managers. Um, and some of these managers became my biggest advocate. So, for example, the first a hiring manager of mine he suggested that I consider a position as the Met Lab foreman. And you can tell by the name of the job, it was a foreman position. Um, so this position was basically responsible for metallurgical analysis and chemical process analysis um, in support of operations in what was known as the track type tractors division at that time. And I applied for the job and I got the position. Um, so I became the supervisor of 35 hourly UAW workers, most of them old enough to be my father. Um, so I wasn't a metallurgical engineer and this was a big change for me, but I decided to go for this opportunity. Now some of these employees were kind, even though they knew more about the role than I did, um, they treated me with respect. And some of them were performance issues, they had difficulty staying on task or they had difficulty meeting the quality expectations of the role. 
Um, and some people were going through personal issues, such as divorce or health issues. We have even had an instance where one of the individuals struck another individual, and we had to go through a process of uh, dismissing that individual. I learned so much. I had this role within five years of being in the company. And you see, this was a real game changer for me, because in subsequent interviews and subsequent opportunities, when I was asked if I had supervisory experience, I was always able to leverage the time that I had in the Met Lab as the Met Lab foreman. Now, at this point in time, I also pursued my MBA. And um, I did this over four years. I took two classes per semester, and I took most of the summers off. And very often I'm asked, was this worth all of the effort? And I do believe that it was worthwhile. I was exposed to different subjects such as law, um, strategy, economics, accounting, different topics that made me a more well-rounded manager and that I was able, able to leverage in future jobs. Um, at this point, a mentor of mine contacted me and asked if I would consider being a Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Now, this was a really big opportunity for me. This was a double promotion, and it was a movement into another tier of management in the company. When I got the call about this opportunity, I was sitting in my doctor's office, and I was nine months pregnant. <laughs> and for a moment I thought, do I tell him I'm pregnant? <laughs> and of course, honesty is the best policy, and there was really no way of denying the fact that I was going to be busy for a few weeks. So I, I let him know that I was um, expecting my daughter, and fortunately for me, he delayed the interview process. And six weeks later, I went in and I interviewed, and I got the position. Now, becoming a Six Sigma Master Black Belt was a big deal because we had to go through extensive training to learn the Six Sigma, Six Sigma methodology. And we had um, to teach classes of engineers to teach them the methodology and the statistics. And we also had to coach the black belts to make sure that they were fulfilling the methodology requirements and meeting the financial commitments of their projects. So it was a very busy schedule. And not only that, but I became the safety champion for specialty products. Specialty products is a department that designs and manufactures um, components such as non-metallics, like seals or hoses. And so they have a very large manufacturing footprint of about, at that time it was about 20 focus facilities. And so my job as the safety champion was to um, help manage and strategize around the safety process and drive the recordable injuries down across specialty products. This was the point in time when Caterpillar was very focused on making a significant improvement in their safety metrics. And there was a lot of focus and attention on whether or not we delivered. And even though I had a newborn at home, um, I decided to go for the opportunity, and with the support of my husband, who stepped up and really helped out on the home front. So I went for this opportunity. Now, years later, I was in another role, and I was feeling kind of bored, not very challenged in my role, and I was trying to figure out what to do with the next opportunity. So I actually went to a SWE conference in America, and it was my first SWE conference, and I found myself surrounded by thousands of female engineers, and it was such a unique experience. Um, and these women were very focused on their careers, different issues that they have, um, how to balance your work and your life, how do you handle the, the children dynamic, how do you negotiate for payroll increases, how do you negotiate for flexibility in your life? Lots of different topics. And one of the sessions I went on was on networking. And I began to reflect on my own career, and I realized how important 
my own network had been to get me to the stage that I was at. So I decided to put it to the test. And I went back to Illinois and created a presentation of all of my most recent accomplishments. And I reached out to a manager I had worked with in the past. He was a very charismatic, driven individual. And sometimes he was quite intimidating. Uh, so nevertheless, I, I sat down and I met with him and I went through my information. And he took my information and he advocated for me with a group of pro his product managers. Now, his product manager said, I don't know the first thing about Ashling. Um, we don't know her, we don't know her name, we don't know anything about her. But one product manager decided to take a chance on me. And I interviewed and got the position as the integration manager integrating Caterpillar components on Bucyrus equipment. Bucyrus was the single biggest acquisition Caterpillar had ever made. This role was like a program manager, um, leading the technical organization to deliver on their requirements, but it also had a lot of financial governance. We had a lot of report outs to vice presidents on a monthly basis and a lot of financial accountability to make sure we were delivering uh, to the commitment that we'd made with the acquisition. Um, the product manager that took a chance on me was a strong female product manager. It was such a privilege to work with her because I got to observe her with executives and to see how she behaved. She never lost her cool. She always kept her composure and she never let comments undermine her. So it was a great experience to work alongside this female product manager. Now onto my latest adventure. Uh, I recently moved to Germany and I became the technical manager for Longwall Coal Mining. Uh, I, have a, I had originally a team of 150 engineers based in Germany, Australia, America, and China. And when I took this position, I didn't know anything about mining or coal mining, and I didn't know anything about the team at all. But this time I was coming back across the Atlantic. It, was more, it wasn't just about me, it was about my husband and my two children as well. And so we did a pew matrix to figure out if this would be a good solution for our family. And we decided it would be a good opportunity. So we're very lucky. Our children have done really well. They've gone to international school and they've made friends from all over the world and have learned different languages. Um, Caterpillar has enabled my husband to work in Germany as well, which is unusual for uh, two and a couple to be placed. And my husband has led a team of German engineers and was also involved in a new product program. For me, the biggest challenge about coming to Germany was the fact that mining has gone through a huge downturn. And mining, the industry, has gone through a lot of restructuring. So for me, my team, we also had to go through restructuring. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do to let engineers go. And I'm very proud of the team because Despite the fact that we went through all of this change, we still managed to deliver on our orders and meet our customer requirements, and we still managed to do development of new product concurrently. So, hard work and good results are very important. But there are things you can do to help your career, such as leveraging your network, taking on different assignments, and um, stretching yourself when the opportunity arises. Another thing that's very important in, in your organization is the culture of your company. And this can really have an influence on your ability to succeed. So, when I was reviewing different companies, when I wanted to um, evaluate where I was going to work, I, I can distinctly remember the night before hiring on a Caterpillar and I read the Code of Conduct. The Code of Conduct is a set of behaviors that all employees are expected to behave by. And it, over the years, it has expanded to include our values. Uh, integrity, excellence, commitment, team
teamwork and sustainability. We have a strong culture of fairness and equity and I can safely say the code of conduct had a big influence on my decision to come and work at Caterpillar. Now diversity and inclusion activities are taking a new level in many companies and the logic is clear. It has demonstrated better financial results, it's, it's easier to retain talent if we have a diverse and inclusive workforce, um, it's better for supplier and customer, rela customer relations, and also our innovation results are more successful. So many companies are really emphasizing and improving on their diversity and inclusion activities. I'm very excited about some of the recent developments that are happening at Caterpillar. Two years ago, Caterpillar has um, promoted their first female group president called Denise Johnson. And Denise is the executive sponsor for a global initiative called Women in Leadership. And Women in Leadership is looking at the strategy around women at various stages of their career and how do we help them with some of the issues they face to stay in their career or to advance in their career. Some of the topics that, the, that it addresses, it looks at sponsorship. Do our executives really understand the issues? Are they really talking about uh, women in leadership and promoting this? Some of the topics they're working on are the pipeline. So, you know, how are we retaining people? What are we doing to present ourselves externally? How do we attract talent? And another aspect that Caterpillar is looking at is the culture. You know, do we have a flexible environment? Do we make it possible for people to work from home if somebody has a, a personal issue? Um, what are our policies around family leave? Looking at all of these different things. And one of the interesting things that's come out of the cultural piece is some training called Breakthrough Leadership. This training is creating awareness around unconscious bias. Now we all have our own cultural norm. We have uh, a norm that defines who we are. And it's a function of our, our upbringing, our education, our religion, the country we grew up in. But we have a cultural norm. And we tend to compare things to our cultural norm. An unconscious bias can happen when we encounter something that's different to our cultural norm. Unconscious bias can happen at the organizational level as well. And so the cultural norm of the organization can be aligned with the majority in the organization. So unconscious bias can happen when we're handing out performance evaluations. If you're different to the cultural norm of the organization, you may have a different performance evaluation. Or you may experience a different result if you ask to be considered for promotion, or even to get an interview to get that promotion. So unconscious bias is very real in, the organization, in organizations. And Caterpillar is raising the awareness of this. Now I'm a facilitator for this training and I've uh, led some of this training in Germany and it's very interesting to see the responses to this training. So some people understand really the point that's being made and try to embrace it and try to make some improvements. And some people are downright furious that this training is even happening. They're in complete denial that there is such a thing as unconscious bias. And so it goes to show the need for the training. <laughs> but in general, a lot of people try to embrace the essence of the training, and you can see a little shift in some of the behavior. So it's, it's effective. Um, but the beauty of this training is that unconscious bias takes the pressure off the individual. So if you're in an organization and you're experiencing unconscious bias, it's kind of a lonely place. Uh, you're sort of in isolation. It's hard for you to raise this as an issue. So by my company raising this as an issue and making awareness of unconscious bias, it helps those people who don't fit the cultural norm and it makes it a more inclusive environment. You see, we all want to be part of a community. 
And um, over the holidays, I was making my way through an airport and I saw a book that I decided I was going to you know, pick up and read. And it's called Cure, A Journey into the Science of Mind Over Body. And it's by an author called Marchant. Marchant does research into the medical field. She works with physicians and researchers and patients. And what she's looking at is how the mind can influence the body. So it's a very different kind of book that I wouldn't normally pick up, you know, but it just caught my eye. And so some of the things that she talks about is, for example, burn victims. When they go through treatment, they have a very painful um, therapy. And so um, science is using virtual reality to try to distract the mind and to help the patients go through their treatment. And as a result, their uh, outcome and their healing is a more successful process. And in this book, she has a chapter called The Fountain of Youth, The Secret Power of Friends. And it talks about um, a demographer called Rosero Bixby, who has found a place in Costa Rica that has uh, demonstrated a longer life expectancy. And so um, what they did was they, they measured this and they were able to quantify that there are certain people in this area that have a longer life expectancy. And they wanted to understand the factors that are influencing life expectancy. And what they found was that it didn't have anything to do with money or genetics or your diet. But the factor that inf influenced life expectancy was whether or not you were a part of a strong social network, a part of a community, and if you had exposure to children. So a strong social network is key for life expectancy. She also talks about a study that an epidemiologist did. His name was House. And he decided to monitor the health of a town over a period of time. And he concluded that social isolation is as detrimental to your health as smoking, inactivity, and obesity. So social isolation, in fact, what they found is that our brains react to social isolation as if we're under attack. So now if you compare this to the situation with unconscious bias, strong social networks are very important. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're maybe not the norm, you may find yourself in a little bit of isolation. So strong social networks are key. And if we work on elevating and increasing the awareness about unconscious bias, we can create strong social networks for everybody. And this is one of the things that SWE can do for your organization. As we heard, SWE creates a great community for women. The women can come together, they can go through mentoring and coaching and career development. Not only that, but women can come together and give back to the community in outreach events where they teach children about careers in STEM and promote this and it creates a, a community for women. So in summary, there are many things we can do to improve our careers and there are many things our company can do to improve the culture of inclusion. As you go through this conference over the next few days, think about where you are in your career and what you're trying to accomplish. Where do you want to go? Are you at a point where you want to take on more responsibility? Are you being vocal about that? How much time have you leveraged in your network? Have you done anything to branch out and meet new ma managers in your company? Do you have the courage to take on stretch assignments? Do you have the courage to change the culture in your organization? I wish you a wonderful experience at this conference. I hope you leave feeling excited and motivated about your career with a few new skills to deploy. I look forward to meeting many of you and hearing your stories. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, you know, I had a few prepared questions, but you know, as you're as you're moving along, um, I had a couple questions, especially around uh, culture, which I thought was a really um, uh, interesting part of your keynote. Um, especially because you, you think of like Peter Drucker, and um, you know, he was a big management guru. We're saying uh, he would say that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, and, and so, a question about um, how does the entry level or even a, a middle manager? impact the culture, especially when it comes to DNI. So certainly there are, are executive initiatives that are going on, especially like at Caterpillar, but um, how does someone that's just starting out in their career, how, how can they impact uh, the, the culture and, and what you've seen? I think there's a lot of opportunity for people who are starting out in their career to impact culture. Um, I think a lot of managers would really welcome if you stood up and suggested that you know you have a SWE organization in your company or if you have a um, we call them employee resource groups where um, different employees with different um, experiences can come together and really um, create a diversity group for themselves so there's lots of opportunities and I think many managers would really welcome um, the next generation of women to come forward and create that within their organizations. Because I think, you know, when you think about millennials and, and now Generation Z, um, you know, there's a real sort of advocacy, especially what we see within our younger membership. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious how organizations kind of, um, you know, kind of capture that and make sure that they're able to encourage that within the organization. Is that something that you see the Caterpillar is doing in other organizations or uh, colleagues that you have that are in leadership positions? Yeah, I think you know we need to have an openness to allow people to have some time to invest in these um, activities. And uh, one of the things that Caterpillar does is we have um, a couple of days a year. This is a speci specifically in the US, but we have a couple of days a year where we're encouraged to maybe go out and do some activities in the um, community, um, such as helping with Habitat for Humanity and building homes for some of the poor people. And so there's, there's a way that your culture can support um, people who need to develop these activities. And I love what you had to say about unconscious bias. So, so Swede does a lot of work, and I, I, uh, Jonna had mentioned the, the DNI cards. A lot of the, the, the research in those cards is, um, is around unconscious bias. And so I, I was curious, because it sounded like you were, you were do, leading some training around that. Um, what are some of the meaningful interventions and tools you've seen? So beyond just uh, training, are there things that you've seen that have really been meaningful, especially for uh, whether it's you know, you're a manager or you're just working with a peer? I mean, I think, you know, the more we raise the awareness of unconscious bias, I think we can have more of a dialogue around that. And um, so it's easier for a person to maybe say, did you realize what just happened there was, you know, a little bit of unconscious bias. And so, um, you know, promoting the awareness uh, really helps start that conversation in the organization. And, um, and, and could you describe like some of the, um, the reactions you've had from some of your colleagues? So it, it sounded like initially people were skeptical of the concept, but you see that things are now turning where people are, I don't know if they're embracing it, but they're definitely aware of it and accepting of it or tolerant of, the, of this point of view. Yeah, I think we have quite a mixture. I think there's some people who are um, very open to it and then some people who come in initially and they're, you know, I don't understand the need for the training, but as they go through the training, they really start to understand um, the, the point that's being made. And um, there's a new iteration of this training that's going on, and we have some very powerful um, um, comments from some different females throughout the company who, who are really describing their, their situation. And, you know, they talk about how, you know, sometimes they feel even lonely. They're sitting in a meeting, but they don't even feel like they can contribute. And so hearing these stories really highlights that it can be um, a problem. And we really need to get through this to be able to have an inclusive environment. 
Yeah, I, and, and just to, so we recently did some research um, in partnership with the Work Life Law Center at uh, UC Berkeley around unconscious bias. Actually, with Joan Williams, who was is well known in the field. Uh, so we actually uh, have a sample of about 3,000 that participated, men and women. Uh, and we're also doing another study uh, in India that actually just wrapped up, and we'll be uh, sharing the results of that this summer. And it's it'll be really interesting to kind of benchmark between what we're seeing in the US and, and, and India. So just wanted to point that out. If anyone's, uh, if anyone's interested, please uh, let me know. Um, and I, I just had another question, just talking about your career and, and how you've developed and, and um, uh, s some of the folks that have, have helped you along the way or, or, or been mentors. Um, but I was kind of sort of a forward-looking question, like what do you envision as the, the engineer of 2030? And I, and I know you'd mentioned like having that well-rounded education your, with your MBA. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that you think are really the core competencies that, that you know, for the engineer of 2030? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the engineering degrees are evolving all the time. And I think there's an awareness that, you know, historically we've been taught to focus on electrical or we've been taught to focus on hydraulic. And, you know, I think that understanding systems and cross-functional training and how um, these systems interact is going to be a focus going forward. Um, I think obviously our speed of product development is going to accelerate because of all of the technology we have available. I think our validation activities are going to change significantly. And I think we'll all be leveraging data analytics a lot more as it becomes applied to um, our day-to-day -day business. So it's going, I think there's going to be rapid change and it's going to be very exciting. And are, are there certain things that you see, and how, and not only in the U.S. but just the university system in general, how it needs to evolve? Um, do you find that it's keeping pace with um, what, you, what your company needs, what your organization or other organizations? Yeah, I think certainly there are some programs that are really trying to embrace the system approach, um, and also emphasizing sustainability. And I think it's interesting, here in Europe, um, I just recently learned there's a new directive that is being considered, and it's the circular economy. And it's really emphasizing you know, recycling and minimizing waste. And so sustainability will probably be another aspect of engineering that will be very important going forward. Well, I just want to shift gears here. Does anyone have any questions? I have more that I can ask, but I want to open it up to the, to the group here. So it looks like we have a question. Who, who is first? Right over here, okay. Thank you. So I have a question about the unconscious uh, bias. Mm -hmm. um, when someone shares their story that, that has happened to the person that she might feel that that was unconscious bias for her advancement, and uh, you actually um, contact the person who might be involved um, how does the reaction come? Um, do you have like non-retaliation policies? Um, does, how does that impact the particular culture? I think the way we're approaching unconscious bias really is um, more of an awareness because it really is a, um, a reflex reaction. So it's like, you know, closing your eyes when you sneeze. People don't even necessarily realize that that's just happened. And so by just bringing it to the surface and explaining here's the situation, um, you know, we need to just be able to open about, uh, dialogue about it openly. Um, we do clearly have retaliation policies, um, but we're not talking about trying to get everybody in this confrontational situation where we're always, you know, going to disciplinary action over um, having a dialogue about unconscious bias. So we want to make sure that it's an open dialogue and raising the awareness. And if there is a serious issue, we, we definitely will have our HR policies kick in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm really excited to speak, uh, to ask you something. So uh, I work at Intel. And we have a lot of um, policies to encourage um, more engineering, uh, more women engineering in the workforce. And um, one of the things that I've noticed is that I hear some, um, some male um, employees kind of um, feel upset that there is, for example, um, an award if you have 
uh, a certain amount of women in your organization, if you have more women in your organization, then the, the department gets a higher score for the bonus. And what I was, what I was wondering is um, kind of um, a reverse discrimination is kind of using force in, in the situation. And I'm concerned that this may uh, create a backfire. And what you're talking about, raising awareness to the unconscious bias, um, that sounds like a more dialogue uh, way. Is, are there any uh, other ways that you would recommend uh, to be using to encourage uh, inclusion, but not to uh, create a backfire? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we need to keep emphasizing the value of a diverse workforce. And um, a lot of the men that we're working with, you know, they have daughters or they have wives. And so by putting it in perspective of, you know, how would you like your family to be treated? Um, I think, you know, giving opportunities to bring your daughter to work, um, that kind of thing can help them see the value in um, having a diverse workforce. And really that's what, what it all comes down to in the end of the day is there's value in diversity. And I think that speaks to everybody, no matter what your, your cultural norm is. My question is just, uh, can I continue? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So th the question is just, um, how do you react when you get an employee, so you said that you're doing these um, uh, seminars or awareness uh, and some of the people don't understand what you're talking about and how do you react to people that are saying, but it's not fair, I didn't get the job because that other uh, um, participant got it because she's a woman and I didn't get it because I'm a man and this is, how do you react to that? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, women will go for opportunities and they won't get the opportunity. So just because we have these programs in place, it, it doesn't necessarily make it easier. Um, and I know that every opportunity I've gotten, I've had to work hard for it and demonstrate that I've been able to function at that level before I was given that opportunity. And so um, I think you just need to keep referencing how you are worthy of that opportunity and you have these accomplishments, and this is why you were selected for that opportunity. Another question over here. Is this one? Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, my question is about how men and women work together. So I'm recently married, and it's a, a key topic of conversation for me and my new husband, how we work together. Um, and obviously when I go into my workplace as well and I am surrounded by a lot of guys it's, an, it's a natural uh, evolution for that conversation. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work in an organisation that's a very culturally aware, um, diverse and inclusive so I, I can relax at work actually. Um, and so that conversation is like the next step for me. Um, yesterday Jana told us that on this conference we're 25 countries and I'm aware that the way that men and women work together is very different in different parts of the world. So like in the UK, there's, it's kind of more evolved. You spoke about how Ireland has evolved over the years. But in places like the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, it's different. So for me, my question is, um, what are your thoughts about how we can help each other cross country to develop the way that men and women work together? And how could we support some of those ladies further out into the Middle East to maybe get to where we are? Yeah, I, I think you're bringing up a very good point because um, there are very distinct cultural differences. Um, even my experience working in America for 20 years and then coming to Germany and working in, in North Rhine-Westphalia for the last two and a half years, it's a very different culture. And so I think this could be something that we could analyze, you know, to understand the cultural differences and to try to help um, create programs that actually fit into the cultural uh, norm of that country. So, uh, but you're right, there are distinct differences. And um, in the end of the day, we all come to work and we want to focus on our job and we want to focus on getting the work done. And so emphasizing that is, 
I think, what will make the difference. Yeah, and I would just add that, um, for instance, in, in India, when we were doing roundtables, and we have a few of our cars, a few of the topics around LGBT, which, you know, is is still considered a criminal activity in India. Uh, but we see a lot of the corporate, you know, a lot of these companies actually taking a lead on these issues. So um, it's interesting to see that there's an open dialogue around that, but within the country, it's still considered an illegal activity. Um, so, but that, that's a really interesting question, so thanks. Yeah, for example, we were, um driving here yesterday and I'm here with two of my German colleagues and they were asking, what is dress code, you know? <laughs> and so even some of the words don't translate and so we need to have um, run pilots of information regionally so that we make sure the message we're trying to get across translates. Questions? Oh, right over here. Sorry, I don't know who was first. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, regarding my friend's uh, question about unconscious bias, and you are very eloquent on the subject, how do you deal with the concerns about loss? Because I think that a lot of people are feeling they're losing their value, uh, men. They're losing their value in, in this race, in this competition, where women are, are being introduced into the system, especially for engineers. And uh, from a university, I'm surprised by some of my colleagues saying, why do you need a Society of Women Engineers at our university? We need more engineers anyway. So why just women? Um, the way you know, I kind of cope with this is I, um, you know, for every you know, 10 people who maybe are not supporters, there's one who is. And I tend to try to connect with that person who's a supporter and make sure that they see the, the work that I'm doing and that they can help me, you know, continue in my role or change as I need to. So I think you need to focus on the people who really are genuinely supporters and make a connection with them and work with them because they really want to make a difference. And, and I think you can tell. I think you can tell the people who are sincere and the people who are just, you know, going along with the program. <laughs> Right behind you there. Okay. So my name is Sabine Berg. I work for T Connectivity, and I wanted to actually comment—not just question, but comment. I think what you're doing is really great. Um, the culture of ENI and engagement is very important, as well as putting people on a fast track through role modeling. I can just say, I'm a product of that. Nadia, who you who spoke on behalf of T earlier. She was actually one of the people that drew me in, into our ERG network. We have also ERG networks such as LG, LGTB and women in networks and so forth and young professionals. We have colleagues here from young, young professionals. So being part of this network really gave me the opportunity to show people what I can do besides my job title. It helped me to evolve and it's that stretch it's that going beyond what you're being assigned to do and what you have as a stamp on your forehead. So I encourage everybody, look into yourself, look into your, you know, your inner self, what your aspirations are. What do you want to do? Where are you now? Where do you want to be in a year and a half, two years, three years, five years, that plan? Um, engage with your organization. Ask and don't wait. Say you can and I want to. Um, I think these are important aspects. I lead IND on the segment level of one of our segments. I was an assistant when I joined. I joined because of personal reasons, because my dad was sick and I stopped, stepped up. So now I lead IND in the segment and we went through a tremendous journey and I am proud of our global team. So be part of it, thank you. Right, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, I believe, but I wanted to uh, just give you a chance to any closing comments or... Uh, I just really appreciate the opportunity to come here and to talk to you all, and uh, hopefully there was some value in my comments, so... All right. all right, and I think we have a gift for you. So.